That was fun, huh? Yeah. Some of you old people understood that. And the newer ones, well, it's too bad. <laughs> hey, you suck around. I thought you'd be gone. It's nice to see you. Yeah, amen, amen. Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Acts again, chapter 20. Our Father, we, we are blessed that this is the day that you made. We do rejoice and we are, in glad, are glad in it. For Lord, you're still on the throne. Father, the, the enemy is doing what he can to bring discouragement and fear into the body of Christ. And it seems in many ways he's had some success. But Father, we needed this time. We needed to get away. We needed to spend time with people who think like we do, who love you, who want to serve you, who are, are desirous of being faithful to you. So I, I pray for every one of us who are hearing right now, for those who are watching, even right now, Lord, online, those who will see it later. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move amongst us in a mighty way. Lord, we bless you. We love you, Jesus. And I ask that this message would speak to our hearts in a way that is edifying and encouraging and, and correct. May your Holy Spirit guide me as I share what you've placed on my heart. I would ask this in, in your name. Amen. Chapter 20, beginning at verse 17, the book of Acts. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now Paul has just encountered extreme opposition. He's been preaching the gospel, and he'd been in the city of Ephesus. And while he was there in Ephesus, the silversmith, Demetrius, had fomented a near riot. This was all because Paul had developed a reputation. His reputation was preaching the gospel. In Acts 19, 26, it says, Demetrius said, not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. And so that had fomented a, a near riot. It had caused a tremendous problem. And, and even in that, in chapter 19, even as you read concerning those things, one of the humorous verses in the book of Acts is found in, in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, where it says, Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Sounds like church on Sunday, doesn't it? <laughs> they didn't know why they came together. But the city clerk had intervened. He had to dismiss the people, and so Paul had left Ephesus, and after some time, he began to make his way to Jerusalem, and he intended to go to Rome. While on his way to Jerusalem, he had a, a layover in a place called Miletus, which is about 35 miles south of Ephesus. And from there, he called the elders of the church for one last, if you will, pastor's conference. Now, today there are many professing believers who reject pastoral authority. They especially like to make their opinions known. They do so on social media quite often. I call them social media theologians. Because this is so rampant, I, I just began a series through the book of Titus because I want to address the attitude of rejection of pastoral authority. 
You see, Paul has drawn away some of the men. He wants to speak to them. He wants to give them his last personal message. He will soon say, I know that you all will see my face no more. This is the last time he's ever going to speak to this entire group of men. This is his goodbye to them, his farewell to these beloved co-workers, to these dear friends. And many of us, even as I mentioned yesterday, many of us are beginning to re reach a time when we know that we're going to move and do other things and more than likely hand our ministries to another qualified person. Now, I mentioned that yesterday, and uh, I, I want to clarify something. I don't intend going anywhere personally. I'm not going anywhere um, because I really feel that the Lord has called me to do what I do. But I spoke to my pastor, Chuck, a long time ago, and I asked him the question. I said, Chuck, you've taught me many things, but you never taught me how to step aside. Can you tell me when you think you may step aside? And he said, David, he goes, you are my beloved pastor. I love you. No, he didn't say that. He said, <laughs> you tell me. No, he said to me, when I no longer have joy doing what I do. And guess what? He had joy to the very end. What a model for us to have. What a model. Listen, this isn't in my notes. Let me just share this from my heart very quickly. Your pastor is the one that helps God to form within you the Christ-likeness that others will see. Be very careful whom you choose to be that person in your life. Be very careful whom you look up to because one day you will be like that person because a disciple, it is enough for a disciple to be what? Like his master. And the whole mentoring methodology during the time of Christ was to teach certain things to the people, but they came, these, those who were being mentored, they came to a full maturity when they began to be like their master. So be very careful who you allow to be the main influence in your spiritual life, because we are not motivational speakers, we are shepherds. And what God has called us to do is to help people to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Be very careful who you allow to influence you in that direction. The Apostle Paul had a tremendous relationship with these men. He called them together. He wanted to meet. They came down to see him. This is the last time he's going to have a, a mini pastor's conference with these men. It's his final farewell to them. He will see them no longer face to face. And so he begins to share with them as his fellow servants. Notice verse 18. Notice how he begins. He says in verse 18, when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. He points first to his personal life as a pattern for a Christian leader. He begins to speak concerning his consistent conduct, the consistent conduct that reveals a heart for Jesus Christ. You see, we need to understand that often we are the only Bible that, that people actually really read, and they watch the way we live, and, they, and they, they, they begin to emulate the things that we do. Proverbs 20, verse 11 says, Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. So as, as ministers of the gospel, we need to know that, that our lives are being watched by others, those in our fellowship who hear us speak the word, teach the word. Well, they're not always in the church building, are they? They're out there in the, in the community, and, and they're in places you may not even be aware that they're at. My wife, Marie, and I were going on a ministry trip on one occasion, and we were at the Ontario airport, and while we were there, we had to get from point A to point B, and we had to be there at a certain time, and so our plane, our flight was canceled. And, and you know, when I get upset, I'm very quiet. Marie knows that I'm not happy, but nobody else will, you know, because I'm not, I don't, I, I just get very quiet, and there I am starting to fume over this, and I'm beginning to go over my schedule. Well, if I leave at this time, I'm gonna, and I'm standing in line because we have to get a flight, not from Ontario, but we have to go to LA. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, you know, and you, some of you guys know exactly what I'm saying. 
You're just thinking, how's this going to work? Oh, Lord, and I'm, I was griping and complaining to Jesus. I was so upset, saying, I can't believe this. I can't. And Marie's now looking at me, and my eyes are bulging, and my mustache is straight. She knows I'm upset. <laughs> and um, and I get, finally, I get to the, the, the desk there to speak to the, the clerk behind the desk, and she looks at me, and I'm like this. And she goes, Oh, Pastor David, I go to your church and you, hi, how are you? <laughs> Praise the Lord, isn't God good? Yeah. And the Lord speaks my, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. Now, I'm sure most of us have gone through things like that. It's true. And the Lord from the beginning reminds us that we are the Bible that people read very often, right? We need to be aware of who we are. Paul could point to himself and he can say, you know what manner of life I always lived. I was consistent among you. And therefore, our, our, our conduct, our lifestyle is on full display. Paul is what you would call a living letter. He encouraged people to imitate his life. Remember 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Philippians 4, verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He could point to himself. He could say, I'm a model of what faith is. And you can see the fruit of my life. Look at how God is with me. He can be with you too. You see, he, he, he knew that people learn a life of faith by, by watching Christians as they serve him. And Paul had a living faith, and it was one that he would encourage others to have also. Godly, faith-filled lives are modeled, and it helps Christians to learn how they themselves ought to live. In James 3.13, the question is asked, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by, be by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And so when the Lord is moving in you, you have a life that people can look at. So his credibility was fortified by his consistency. Notice how he said, you know from the first day in what manner I always lived among you. These elders were men that Paul had spent time with, men he had mentored. He spent three years teaching them. He equipped them for ministry. And it would seem that his life was an open book before these elders. Because he says, from the first day, I've laid out a godly example to you. That means he was consistent. He didn't have a ministry mask and an ordinary guy mask. You see, ministers can have the temptation to wear that ministry mask. Uh, we can be under pressure. And so we begin to want to let our hair down with our, our peers. But we need to ask ourselves if minister is something we do or is someone we are. Because what I do springs out of what I am. So what we are in the pulpit is an expression of who we are as a person. We're, we're a Christian first, we're a pastor, we're an elder, deacon, teacher, whatever, afterwards. And the size of, of our church, the amount of pressure, the trials, the problems, the deadlines, the activities, the frustrations, <laughs> don't give us permission to be less than what we would expect of others. So if you want to earn the respect of those you serve, consistency is the key. Consistency can actually produce and enhance your credibility. And Paul lived a, a godly life, and he developed a credibility. He, he basically earned their respect. And so what is this life that he lived? Notice what he says in verse 19. What kind of life did you always live amongst these men, Paul? Well, verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. You saw this in my life. I served the Lord with humility, tears, trials. So he reminded them that service is not simply to man, but it always begins with the Lord. And Christian service is not primarily man-centered at all. It's God-centered. We have to be careful to remember that. Be careful to keep your service first to the Lord, not to be 
seen and admired by men. Let me share with you something that is an obvious theme of this pastor's conference. It all relates to this, this season that we're in, the season of, of COVID and all. My wife Marie and I had COVID as many of you did. As a matter of fact, I still have it. I've been hugging and kissing all of you. And it's, <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> no, I don't have it. We got well. Now, I'm not giving to you any kind of advice. I'm just telling you what happened. My wife wasn't feeling well. And I looked at her. And she said, I think I have it. So I kissed her in the mouth. And I said, where you go, I go. Oh, here I go. I'll be back. <laughs> Jesus said that. I'll be back. But anyway, <laughs> Arnold's, Arnold stole that from him. You know that, don't you? But I said, you're not going anywhere without me. See, Jesus, we walk with our, our shepherd through the valley of the shadow of death, right? There's nothing that says that two of us can't go hand in hand. Amen. And so I kissed my wife. And I got it pretty bad, pretty bad. But do you want to know something? I didn't do it to tempt the Lord because, oh, that's presumptuous, isn't it, Pastor David? No, I, I didn't consider it that way. To be real with you, I wasn't afraid of it, and I still am not. I just personally was not. You know, I get other things, flu and stuff like that. I, never, I haven't had the flu in years. I can't tell you when the last time I had the flu was. I get other things like cancer, things like that, but not, <laughs> but not flus. So it wasn't stupid on my part. It was just, I'm going to go with you, baby, because let's do this together, and we did. You know, and the Lord worked... And he worked through it. And so what happened is, uh, I'll get back to my story. We, we returned from Israel in February of 2020. And the churches were then shut down in March. And so what we did is we followed the order to shut down for a few weeks out of concern for our people. From the first day of the shutdown, Marie and I, along with a few of my staff members, came to the church grounds, and we would minister to whomever showed up. We would be out there, and, and nobody knew. I didn't advertise. I didn't tell the church. I didn't put it on Facebook. I didn't make an issue. I simply showed up because I, I told my guys, I said, listen, I've been doing this all these years. Why would I stop now? I know where I'm supposed to be on a Sunday morning, and I'm going to be there. And so my, some of my staff came. The others I fired. But anyway, I was there. <laughs> and people would come rolling up. And they would see us. And they'd go, hi, Pastor. Because they had come to, to give their gifts. Because we had uh, agape boxes outside and all of that. And, and, and Marie and I were there. And so before you know it, Others are starting to show up and all, and we're just ministering to ever, whoever would show up. And so at a certain point, uh, around the first week of May, some of the church formed a convoy. I asked if we might have a picture. I don't know if we have it. Yeah, we had a little convoy out there in, 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 our, in the church grounds and all. And so I'm looking at these people, and there were about 150 or so that showed up. And and so I'm looking at them, and, and it's warm, and they're all wanting to mill around and talk. And I said, let's go in the chapel. So we went in the chapel. We have a picture of that. We went into the chapel, and because I had my worship minister, Jared, with me, I said, lead him in some worship. And so he led some worship, and I went up and gave a, a devotion. And, and so now they're saying, what are you going to do next week? And this was, this was at the beginning of, of uh, May, I believe it was, first week of May. So we had closed down for about three weeks, four, three, about three weeks or so, four weeks. And, and we, I said, I, I've been here every week. So they started coming. And so that's what we did during that time. We just were there for them. I, I didn't publicize it because I didn't 
didn't, uh, didn't think it was something I should do. I, I was there to minister to them because that's what I needed to do. I'm a shepherd and I care about my sheep. You know how Rawls says, I hate this? <laughs> I do too. But there were some to them it revealed our love for Jesus and for them. You see, Paul speaks of serving the Lord, notice, with all humility, tears, and trials. Paul served God. Without pride, without selfish ambition, he served God first, and he served him with tears. I've had pastors, I don't say this for anything other than to say it's true, who have said, why does that guy cry up there? I wonder why they don't cry up there. Because your heart, if it's pierced by the things of the Lord, it flows out. It's, it's not anything other than that. I don't like it. But it happens, and I, I am who I am, like Popeye, you know, and so. <laughs> all I know is that as I read my Bible, more than once it's mentioned that he, that he would serve the Lord, and he did so with a pure heart and even, even tears. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. And that's what Paul had for them. It was a depth of love. And he ministered to them in that, on, in that way. Uh, on the night that the shutdown was announced here in California, my son Joseph and his, his wife Karina and our baby, our granddaughter, uh, they, were, they were at our house. They were living. They were doing some work, I believe, on, on their house at that time. And so we welcomed them in. And, we gave them a good rate for their rent. No, we, we brought them in. And I was seated there on the couch when the, we were watching the news, my son and I, and uh, they announced the, the shutdown. And I turned to my son, Joseph, and I said to him, son, this is not good. This is not a good thing. And I tearfully told him that, uh, I, I, this is what I said. I said, son, and I had tears in my eyes. I said, I knew that one day I would leave the ministry. I just didn't know it would be this way. You see, because our church receives offerings like most every one of us do, and our online giving at that time was only like 30 to 35 percent. We have a mortgage still that we're going to be, God willing, paying off within a month. Or, or two, bless the Lord. Amen to that. And so, yes, yeah, so, but we have a mortgage and it costs a lot of money. And I had at that time 50 staff members. And, and so there's only 35% of our offering coming online. That means that the 65% that we normally need in order to survive is no longer going to be coming in. And I was thinking, Lord, I'm going to have to fire everybody so I can keep my salary. And no, I didn't. <laughs> I feel sorry for them, but you will provide God. I know you will. <laughs> well, the next week came the shutdown. And as I was, as I was going to the office, which we continued doing, I was praying, and I said, Lord, I, I, I don't know what you plan on doing. And he reminded me of something. You know that still, small voice that the Lord sometimes will actually place in your heart? Many, many years ago now, we were looking for uh, a place, and, and uh, we couldn't find a place to rent and all. It's before we owned properties. And, and I, I was crying out to the Lord, and I said, God, I don't know what we're going to do. And the Lord said, I did not raise you up to let you fall. I'll never forget that, that, that voice. I didn't raise you up to let you fall. I was driving to the office, and I said, Lord, 35% offering isn't going to, it's not going to, we can't survive. 
I heard the same voice. I did not raise you up to let you fall. And as I was meeting with my administrator, he said, you know, I said, so what are, you know, what are the damages? You know, what do we have to do to adjust? And he says, well, he goes, he, the, the, we got the normal offering online. He said, but somebody came in and brought a check that actually boosted what we normally got when everybody was there. It was over that. And I knew the spirit of the Lord, you know he is, you know he provides, you know he does. But it was just, I needed that from the Lord and he has continued obviously taking care of us all the way. God provided. Now I, I, I want to say this as a pastor, I wasn't concerned for myself. You see, many years ago, my father went home to be with the Lord over 20 years ago. And so when daddy went to be with Jesus, my father left my mother nothing. He, he left her a $10,000 insurance. Um, that's what she got, $10,000 uh, $10, in insurance. That was it. My mom had to sell her home. Uh, it was just a real sad thing. And so when my father went home to be with Jesus, I just said to the Lord, I'm not going to do that to my wife. I'm just not going to do that. And so I began to put money away, and I've been doing that for over 20 years. And so I knew that I could survive. I knew that I'd make it because I had attempted to, to be wise in my stewardship. I was concerned for my staff because, though I may be prepared, I don't ask them about their financial situations. So I don't know if they are or they're not. And so I started to weep. The reason I was, was weeping wasn't for myself. The reason I was weeping is I don't know how I'm going to be able as a shepherd to care for these people. And that's where that all came from. And so what happened is the Lord provided, and, and that calmed my heart, and it helped me to understand how good God is to us. You see, Paul was one who suffered. He suffered at the hands of unbelieving Jews. But we very often have to deal with Christians. You know, Christians are sheep. And I, I, say you're walking at midnight, you're going through an alley in a bad place of town, and you hear something by a trash can moving, and what's the first thing you do? Oh my God, I'm dead. And then a sheep comes out from around that trash can. Are you scared? Oh my God, a, a sheep. No, you say, oh man, good, pork chops. No, you... you <laughs> Or not pork chops, lamb chops. <laughs> oh, why not pork chop? You can call a lamb chop pork. Anyway, no, it's a sheep. Sheep are not scary. But I, I tell my church this on occasion, sheep may not be scary, but they still have teeth. And they still bite. And, and your sheep, my sheep, those whom God has entrusted into our care can be harsh. They can be unfairly critical. And they can even go so far as to question who you are and where is your faith. Just last week, Someone opened up a question on Instagram that brought accusations against me. They, there was somebody who was saying our church is filled with pro-abortion, pro-vaccine, mask-wearing, faithless, drinking leftists. And I said, Raul, you could say that to my face, bro. Why do you, why do you have to write that? And they came from your church. No, I'm... No, but they did. They did. That, that I am, you know, it's filled with homosexuals and the whole nine yards. Um, the church can be very cruel. And yet, there are others who, who say that your steady faithfulness in moving us in the right direction is a strength to them. You see, Paul earned respect by remaining strong under intense opposition. In Galatians 6.17, he said it like this. He said, from, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, I've earned your respect because the sacrifice that he went in, that he had, that he had, he had made for, the, for them, produced a loving credibility and a trust. And so as he's speaking to them, serving the Lord, he goes on in verse 20, and he says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and, and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentant toward God and, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I, I, I kept back nothing. Notice that was helpful. I proclaimed it to you. I taught you. I didn't keep back anything from you that would, would encourage you to have spiritual maturity. As elders, I knew you must grow in wisdom. I knew you needed to grow in goodness. I knew you needed to grow in holiness. And, and, and because, because that is necessary, I held nothing back. You see, we, when we minister, are being used by God to produce a holy and godly church. And, and for that reason, he's saying, I held nothing back. I gave you the whole counsel of God from A to Z. Now, how important has teaching the word been in my ministry? It's been, it's been everything. In, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said to go into the world, remember, and he said, make disciples. He went on in verse 20 to say, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the commission of the church is to teach people the all things, the things that Jesus commanded. And, and teaching occurs, I think, best by that verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Scripture because that's what produces disciples. And teaching all things is of infinite importance because it produces the genuine disciple. Is it not true that the truth sets us free? Absolutely. Jesus' words are to be faithfully and thoroughly communicated. In John 6, 63, it's the spirit that quickens the flesh, profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. So the gospel is the power of God that results in salvation to those who believe. It's God revealing how he saves men from misery and how he gives them eternal life. What you need to do, if I may speak to you as a, a brother, and you who occupy pulpits, you who teach on Sundays, look out at your congregation. Look at your congregation and do not look at them as an audience. Don't walk out there with them, and forgive me if this sounds harsh, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a point. They're not, they are not my ladies and gentlemen as so many people say, ladies and gentlemen, oh, if that's your way of speaking, God bless you. But they're my brothers and my sisters. And I look at them that way. And when I teach them, it's out of a heart of love for them as a shepherd. Look out at your congregation. Look out at it. And as you look out, you're going to see the recent widow. As you look out in that congregation, you're going to see that worker who just lost their job. As you look out in that congregation, you may see the abused child or the neglected wife. You may look out there and see the mother who just lost her child, the husband with the unfaithful wife. They're there. They're there. I had a lady approach me once after service. She said my sister was at the river, had a little, her boat, and had a, a rope tow on a, uh, an inner tube. And her, her six-year-old nephew, this woman encouraged the little boy to get on the inner tube. He didn't want to, he was only six. He was afraid. So she coerced him, yeah, it'll be fun, you'll enjoy yourself. And so she began to draw him, he was, she, she was, you know, in the boat, she was picking up speed. She came around a turn, and there was a boat that was parked that she didn't see. And the inner tube, the little boy in the inner tube, slammed right into the boat and was killed instantly. Six years old. There she is sitting in our churches. There she is. I spoke to a guy. He said, Pastor, can you pray for me? I've been married for X amount of years. He said, my wife and I have been infertile, but my wife just became pregnant. The problem is it's not my child. That's in your, in your church. You may not know it, especially if we're driven to have more numbers. It's not numbers, it's people. It's not numbers, it's needs. We're shepherds. We are not there trying to come up with a higher figure of people who are sitting in our pews because a lot of churches are filled with empty people. And what we need is we need to give them the words of life. And be careful that you don't begin to commercialize the gospel of Jesus 
to make it something people really need to hear so that you can brag at a pastor's conference how many people you have. Be careful. That's one of the enemies of real godliness, the success that you take credit for. Be careful. Look at your congregation. Listen to them. They come and speak to me every Sunday after church. I'm up in the front. And they'll come and speak to me. And I can tell you, these things I just told you are things I've heard. The little girl, the young woman, little college student, who approaches me after church and she says, Pastor, can you pray for me? And I say, of course, what can I pray about? She says, I was at the laundromat last night and I got raped, can you pray for me? That's in your church. Look at your people when you speak to them. They're your brothers and they're your sisters. They're people with hurts and needs and pains and memories and sorrows and griefs and loss. Look at them. I'm not saying be depressed about it. I'm saying be aware because they are sheep without a shepherd. They've come to hear the good news, something to set me free, something to give me hope. Be aware of that, my brothers and my sisters. We've had so many funerals. We average 52 funerals a year. We've had many funerals. This year, we, we've had, I, I didn't get an update. I got this a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago or so. And I know that we had had 17 COVID deaths, you know, but next week we're gonna have on Friday and Saturday, we're gonna have three funeral services. So I, I've become very, very sensitive to these things. There can be sadness in your congregation. We need to remember that. We need to remember that the next president isn't going to save them. Jesus does. And that's why we preach the gospel. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. You see, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's the commission we have. We declare the things of the Lord to bring glory to him. Like it says in Psalm 96, 3, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the peoples. So we have a special charge. We've been instructed to bring his message to a world and to do it courageously. Now, somebody says, well, wait, you have some saying you ought to say something about politics and other. No, I think that it goes hand in hand. I don't see the reason to divide that. If you're going through a passage of scripture, speak the truth and apply it so that people hear it. But my goal is not to convert people to become Republicans. My goal is to bring people to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that's why I do that. That's how I do that. The Bible says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convicts, rebuke. A convinced rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine according to their own desires because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth, be turned aside to fables. That's going on right now. So as a pastor, I've been given the charge of proclaiming the truth of God's word to the world because his truth is revealed through his word and I confidently present it as such. In Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth. So remain faithful to the clear presentation of the word of God. Resist anything that replaces or dethrones God's word in the church. Our music teams, our programs, our special effects, our PowerPoint presentations, our humor, emotional illustrations, our testimonies, exaggerated success stories will not save and build our people up. Jesus does. Keep that in mind. It is not within the power of human beings to change their own nature. Man cannot change his nature by good works, church affiliation, or rituals. Change comes through receiving the good news of the gospel by being born again. And that's why we don't veer to the left or the right. That's why we keep plodding forward, giving God's word. That's how it works. Now notice, I don't know, Tom, I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> oh, well, um, <laughs> I really don't. 10.15, I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will close with respect. 
When you're asked to do something, you ought to. <laughs> That's why Paul would always close his epistles with three or four closings, because you never knew when it's really going to end. <laughs> but let me close this in this way. I've been asked how I have remained steadfast for all these years. I got saved in 1970. I've been teaching the Word since 1973. Um, I've been pastoring as an ordained pastor since 79, planted our church in 81. How have you remained faithful all of these years? It's very simple. I try to keep my eyes on the prize. At the very end, and this is sincere, at the very end, my great desire, and it's growing this way daily, is to hear him say, well done. Well done, my, my good, my faithful servant. I gave up the desire, we all have it, to be known. I'll close with this. You see, Paul is saying goodbye to some men he loved. After telling them, you will see my face no more, the scripture tells us they wept freely, fell on Paul's neck, kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. When you love your people, when you love those you work with, and it's time for you to move on or you go to heaven. I would hope that there would be tears in their heart for someone who loved them. I would hope that. I, I, I don't say that with a morbid need for attention. I simply say, I would like my life to count for something. And I would like people that I ministered to and gave my life for to know how deeply I did love them. And it's not because I want attention. There was a woman who had broken an alabaster vase, a jar, very expensive perfume. She broke that jar. She poured out the perfume and anointed Jesus, and the fragrance filled the house. It wasn't the jar. It was what was, this, what was in it, the fragrance of Christ. When people leave your church service, what they talk about after being there is something you ought to be aware of. If they're talking about how things got to change and we're going to do some things, that can easily lead to, and I hate this world we live in. Or if they walk out saying, we have hope in Jesus Christ. He's still on the throne. He's with me, brings comfort to me, empowers me. I, I can do it, then you're doing the job of a pastor. If you're getting them angry, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Be careful with that. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. And love those who despitefully use you. Be aware of that, because it isn't a battle of the Democrats and the Republicans. Republicans it's a battle of evil. And we're on the winning side. Let's make sure our people know that when they leave our churches. <laughs> Father, bless and thank you for your work in our life. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.